Thank you for the warm welcome. And uh, first, I wish to express my sincere thanks to our presenter um, for such an informative, accessible, um, and of course, integrating lecture. If I may just recap what I heard today, um, continuing with the, with the premise that multiculturalism in psychology, including the psychology of religion, provides integrationists a seat at the table with an opportunity to influence the discipline as a whole, Dr. Hill took a look at virtue from a cultural perspective. Using Alistair McIntyre, he observed that renewed interest in the virtues due to the popularity of positive psychology has led to the widespread attempt to define virtues in ways that are independent of specific traditions, resulting, uh, sadly in his view, in thin, lowest common denominator views of these virtues. And he added that this may hide largely Western underlying assumptions as well. So it is with cultural context in mind that he went on to consider the virtues of humility, intellectual humility in particular, and gratitude. Um, in the first case, we saw Colonel Jessup, who believed that only he was capable of handling the truth, was unwilling to acknowledge his own limitations as a military leader, was unable to admit his preoccupation with status. And so he provided the foil against which Dr. Hill discussed the virtue of intellectual humility. Recognizing both the philosophical um, uh, roots of psychology and the dearth of theistic accounts of intellectual humility, uh, Dr. Hill found New Testament references to intellectual humility and also provided contemporary evidence that it is, particular, it, it, it is a particularly religious virtue he then showed us how, um, well, he didn't do this um, very much, actually, but he <laughs> in the paper, he showed us how Augustine's confessions exemplify an intellectual humility that is grounded in a particular kind of relationship of glad dependence on an omniscient, omnipotent and loving God, which is in stark contrast to Kant's understanding of enlightenment. In the second case of gratitude, Dr. Hill found similar problems of generic treatments that neglect gratitude to God. So I, if I may begin by exercising some intellectual humility myself, using the three characters that Dr. Hill outlined, categories that Dr. Hill outlined, under one, awareness of one's limitations, I confess that I know very little about psychology. I have never studied it, except a little, I suppose, within studies of education a very long time ago. Secondly, on uh, being other-oriented rather than self-focused, I wish to appreciate Dr. Hill's prowess in the field, the work he has accomplished and his skill in sharing it with us. I'm grateful that you presented in such a way that, e that I could readily connect and even appreciate what you were saying. Um, thirdly, teachability. I wish to express my willingness to learn and to be corrected today. Even though I was graciously sent the paper two weeks in advance, that did not leave quite long enough to take a crash course in psychology. Um, therefore, what I say will be out of ignorance and, unlike this excellent lecture, speculative rather than based on any evidence. But I will speak from what I do know something about, which is missiology, theology of the Holy Spirit, um, and Christianity as a world religion. Additionally, because I'm only feeling my way into the subject, my observations will be about the um, overall approach of this series of lectures, as well as specific to this lecture. Um, just a little um, a bit more biography to explain where I'm coming from. As you heard, I'm relatively new on the faculty at Fuller. I was appointed to the School of Intercultural Studies only in 2017. But I did a master's degree. Um, <coughs> uh, excuse me, I think I might need that water bottle down there. Um, uh, in, S, in SIS um, a long time ago. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm English, excuse me. As you may have guessed by now. Um, but I arrived at Fuller um, it, it, back in the day um, from, um, from South Korea, where I had been living for five years with my husband, Sebastian Kim, who is Associate Provost now for the Korean Studies Center here and Professor of Theology and Public Life. We were on our way to, to India, where we were commissioned to serve as missionaries of the Presbyterian Church of Korea. 
During my time at Fuller, I took a lot of courses um, in the School of Theology as well as um, the School of Intercultural Studies, but none, sadly, in the School of Psychology. I don't know whether it was possible at the time, but it didn't suit my interests. However, I do remember observing the extent to which theology in the, U in the USA was, was psychologized um, in its attention to, to counseling, personal faith journeys, and inner struggles, or that's how it seemed to me. So I was, I was conscious of the influence of psychology on theology, but because I didn't do any psychology, I thought of the, school of, um, of the schools of psychology and intercultural studies as kind of two opposite sides of the school of theology, I suppose. <laughs> I, I thought psychology deals with inner life, but missiology treats cultures, religions, and societies. I've been disabused of that today. Um, psychology seems to be about introspection and missiology with external action. Might be more truth in that. Uh, psychology is about healing people, but missiology is about changing the world, including structurally so that people don't get hurt in the first place. My simple mind thought. Maybe there's some truth in those obs rather provocative observations, um, but I'm beginning to re realize, of course, that there are many areas of overlap between the, um, the disciplines. Questions of mission motivation, spirituality, and character, of course. Mission service and leadership have psychological dimensions. And then there is, of course, the, the member care with issues of burnout and resilience, the crossing of continents and migration, or at least um, intercultural and interreligious work raise issues of culture shock and self um, and identity. Of course, these issues relate to the activity of mission, but um, in addition, the content of mission, of course, if it is truly integral mission, means addressing mental health and other psychological uh, problems along with other human needs. And one of the um, uh, SIS PhD students I'm teaching in this year's cohort has a psychological dimension in, um, to her degree as she's looking at children at risk from the protect, uh, perspective of trauma and, and, and healing. However, my own interest in mission studies is mainly theological and also a bit historical. Um, my research into the mission the theologies of theologians in India and later in Korea led me into intercultural pneumatology, um, published mainly in this book by Orbis back in 20, 2007. Um, it seemed to me that um, in Asia, Christians had a much better understanding of the word spirit on which to base their reading of the Bible uh, and from which to understand the Holy Spirit. Some of these meanings of spirit were close to soul or self and therefore more psychological to do with self-realization or self-cultivation. They connect readily with the virtue approach that runs through these lectures. But other translations of Ruach and Numa in Asian contexts were collective. They represented the ideas of culture, zeitgeist, community, or ways of a way of living. The Holy Spirit was what bound people together imbued community identity and inspired art and music. Then there was a third category of Asian pneumatology that treated the spirit as life giver and liberator and read the pneumatology of the Bible through that, that lens in a way that pointed to economic justice, social transformation, eco-justice. In Asia, my narrow European Protestant evangelical understanding of the Holy Spirit as illuminator of scripture, guide in personal matters, encourager of faith, and occasional source of power was exploded into a much wider one. From a Hindu view of enlightenment, I realized that in the Bible too, our, our human spirit is connected with the divine spirit from a Christian point of view, qualitatively different, yes, but still worthy of the same name, spirit. From a Korean cosmology, I understood that the Holy Spirit is moving in a world of many spirits, personal, economic, political, and so on. In other words, the spirit in me was not an isolated, numinous soul, but part of a complex network of the spiritual world, which is intimately engaged with the material world in, that we inhabit. 
The Holy Spirit is not involved only with a separate category of spiritual or charismatic life, but present and active in all life. This, after all, is the confession of the Nicene Creed, which calls the Holy Spirit the Lord, the giver of life. This understanding of the Spirit as life-giving formed the basis of the World Council of Churches 2013 statement, Together Towards Life, Mission and Evangelism in Changing Landscapes, for which I chaired the, the drafting group. From this, um, from this perspective, I particularly appreciated the way in which, from the outset of these lectures, Dr. Hill situated the virtues discussion in the ordinary, in life. Much pneumatology, especially mission pneumatology, has been about signs and wonders. But the Holy Spirit is not encountered only in the extraordinary. Nor is spirituality about a different spiritual world, but about this world, bringing us into it, enlivening us, and affirming what is life-giving. John V. Taylor, leader of the um, English Church Mission Society, reflecting on his experience of the wholeness of life in Africa, described the Holy Spirit as the, the go-between God. The Spirit connects us together across barriers in the one body of Christ and draws us into the Trinitarian life of God. If the Spirit's work is holistic, then so is spirituality and religiousness. Christian concerns and Christian mission can never be narrow, but to adapt the 2011 Cape Town commitment of the Lausanne movement, we are about the whole gospel, the whole world and whole people. I support Dr. Hill's desire to avoid lowest common de denominator views of religion and to carry out work on actual religions from an emic or inside view. But from the pneumatological integrating perspective, I confess that I found the focus on, of, of psychology on individual lives and personal experience rather limiting and not a true reflection of religion as I understand it. After yesterday's lecture, I, I rushed down to the library to look at a copy of the edited book that Dr. Hill showed us, Measures of Religiosity, to see in more detail what was covered by psych psychologists under the term. And I saw this impressive survey of the psychology of religiosity in the last century, that was, but it was almost entirely limited to beliefs, attitudes, experience, mysticism, and commitment. In other words, and perhaps not surprisingly, to what is, uh, what is studied is what the Enlightenment deemed religion to be, private and psychological. To my mind, piety would be a better word to describe this entity than religion. There are um, other reasons why I'm uncomfortable with the reduction of religiousness to piety. Um, first, because Jesus didn't seem to be very keen on piety. Um, we read that the Pharisees had piety in abundance and accused Jesus of lacking it. Jesus criticized the Pharisees specifically for public display of piety. So it made me chuckle when I saw in one piece of research people were asked to self-report humility. Of course, in the project, it was <laughs> triangulated with other measures, but it reminded me of Charles Dickens' obsequious Uriah Heap whose stock phrase was, I am ever so humble, I am. <laughs> the Jesus of the Gospels is much more interested in how professed love of God translates into love of neighbor than in cultivating virtues per se. As the Irish Columban missiologist Donald Dorr wrote, reconciliation with others is the only convincing evidence that we are reconciled with God. Second, um, piety, or what counts today as religiousness or religiosity, is not very attractive to or beneficial to wider society. Um, when I was growing up as a Christian, one of the popular books was Fris Riedenau's How to Become a Christian Without Being Religious. <laughs> uh, being religious is certainly not cool, um, and being religious can even be harmful, um, after 9-11 and child abuse scandals and so on, it's not just evangelicalism that is a problem. For many young people, even religion is a toxic term. 
The third reason why I'm uncomfortable with piety of, as a definition of religion is because the religions, as we encounter them in different parts of the world, are much broader than this. They are ways of life. Even within Christianity, piety may not be a predominant or central expression of a person's faith. There's morality, ser uh, ritual, service, community building, political action, to give but a few examples, and I think Dr. Hill mentioned some at the beginning. Religion inspires all sorts of attitudes and expressions that are too varied to be considered under the heading of piety or even virtue. So that brings me to another thorny issue which Dr. Hill rightly emphasized. Our understanding of religion should not be disconnected from actual religions. Having taught a on a religious studies program in England for the last 10 years and having written about Christianity as a world religion, I know how highly contested this field is. There are other entities that, like Christianity, are counted as world religions, although what, no one is sure how long or how short the list of them is. Moreover, there are modern forms of these religions. In other words, our view of them, and to some extent their own self-understanding, has been strongly influenced by post-enlightenment views of religion based on a model of Christianity. Not only that does this distort other ways of life, um, but as we can appreciate, that view is not positive. Um, as we have seen, it reduces religions to a small section of life. In addition, it makes religion a lower category than philosophy and science. By regulating the cat to the category of religions, what are mostly Asian philosophies, sciences, and cultures, and remember even Christianity is Asian in origin, Western thought has marginalized them in the modern world. Another complicating factor, um, as well as the world religions, there are other things which used to be called superstition, um, but that can these days be referred to more positively um, and should be as indigenous religions or spiritualities. Um, was the pre-Christian ancient Greco-Roman culture um, referred to in Dr. Hill's paper, which had nothing to say about humility, a form of religion or not? Uh, though it didn't cultivate virtues, does this mean we can't call it a religion or identify its people as religious? After, above all, there is the sheer variety of what can be included under the label of religion. So it is good to know that there are allies in psychology who by taking a multicultural approach and an experiential approach will push against the boundaries of what is thought of as religious. To be more specific about today's lecture, in the in the exam, the, all the examples were given that were given were were theistic. Um, sorry, all the examples um, of gratitude that were given were theistic. But I'm sure Dr. Hill will re readily concede not all the entities that we call religions express a belief in God. I think this is an interesting question when we come to the topic of gratitude. There is certainly a need to fill in the research gaps by looking at gratitude that is directed vertically to God. And I hope Dr. Hill and his colleagues will do that. But thinking multiculturally and interreligiously, uh, can horizontal gratitude, um, sorry, horizontal and vertical gratitude always be separated? I'm thinking of East Asian gratitude towards parents, for example. One of the questions posed in the encounter with Christianity for Chinese, Koreans, and others who venerated their ancestors was whether or not ancestor veneration was ancestor worship and therefore idolatrous in Christian eyes. But in a non-theistic context, this question makes little sense. Gratitude to the ancestors is neither horizontal nor vertical. The ancestors are not our equals, but neither are they transcendent since they continue to inhabit the world of the living. Finally, to the key virtue that Dr. Hill discussed in this lecture, humility, and specifically intellectual humility. Uh, I will start by saying what a good topic this is to uh, raise in an academic institution. We do need to be challenged not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think 
but to think with sober judgment. Quoting scripture. I found the analysis of um, Augustine's intellectual humility, which was in the paper but not um, expanded in the lecture, um, compelling. And I appreciated the emic approach, the attempt to understand from inside rather to, than to apply a false objectivity from without. But I do have some difficulties with its use here. Um, first, I have difficulty with virtue. Well, not in that way, but, um, uh, and, and with, with humility too, as, as you may have noticed. Um, at least the humility that is expected of others than myself. Um, a focus on virtue can be elite and self-centered. It's one of the most common criticisms of virtue ethics. My encounter with virtue theory has been more in the context of the study of Confucianism than in Christian theology. Confucianism is a religion of self-cultivation, of virtue. In the Korean context, at least, it is an elite male form of religion, in contrast to popular Buddhism, traditional religious expressions, and now Christianity, which include a broad swathe of society. The cultivation of virtue is something that requires capacity beyond merely surviving. Like keeping the Jewish law, it is the poor who most easily fall foul of its requirements. I'm not convinced that Jesus uh, made the same requirements of humility from everyone, or made humility as quite as central as was suggested in the lecture. Moreover, if we look at humility from a feminist or a post-colonial perspective, the power relations are very important. Who is expected to practice humility? Humility is pre preached as a virtue by whom? For whom? Mercy Oduyoye and others in the circle of concerned African women, for example, have drawn attention to the abuse of religion to subordinate women rather than empower them. Humility, or kenosis, implies that there is some power or status to give up. It is not a helpful message for the poor or the disempowered. Looked at this way, humility is a virtue preached to the proud, but not necessarily for others. As in Mary's song, the message to the lowly is primarily that they will be lifted up. Um, and I think the verse was quoted, God opposes the proud. The second half is he gives grace to the humble. Dr. Hill has pointed out that virtues vary according to culture. So they will also vary, I think, according to social status. Second, the example of Augustine is instructive, but may be misleading. Um, he's not typical. He's known as the father of psychology precisely because his confessions were so seminal. He's from the elite of a particular society and his practices may not apply um, to all of us or at least not in the same way. Furthermore, Augustine does not really contribute to the multicultural approach promoted in these lectures because he stands at the origin of Western theology, except that actually he wasn't Western in the modern sense, of course, being from North Africa. Th um, third, we must realize that Augustine's expression of religion was not limited to virtues. Augustine's work is so comprehensive that his interpreters can offer and only engage with part of it. Reading the City of God, we get a different, impression, a, a different sense of Augustine's priorities. His understanding of the religious life was holistic, integral. It was about all of life. It included not only cultivation of virtue, and doctrinal concerns, but also issues of empires, civic corruption, church and state, war and peace, and so on. What we might call socio-political engagement or public theology. So to return to the pneumatology where we began, although he distinguishes them, Augustine refuses to separate the breath of life in creation from the life-giving spirit of Pentecost. Thank you.